By the pricking of my thumbs, something wicked this way comes. Open locks, whoever knocks. Are you ready to make the most of the only life you have? To make smart money choices focused on achieving what you care about most? Here to help you balance living well today without sacrificing your tomorrow is the retirement answer man, Roger Whitney. The last wicked market event you likely experienced was the Great Recession back in 2008. That wicked event saw the S&P 500 index, the stock index, go down peak to trough a little over 50%. Back then, you were eight or nine years younger. You were likely contributing to all of your investment accounts through 401ks and other ways. And if you had the fortitude, you just marched on through it knowing that you're adding assets and that you had a little bit of runway until you reached retirement. Well, now here we are eight or nine years later with the markets up a pretty good percent. I think over the last five years, we've averaged about 14% a year. Now you are eight years older. The runway towards retirement is probably a lot shorter. Maybe you've hit it. You're ready to take off. So the question is, if something wicked this way comes from a market experience, how will your retirement fare for it? And how will you manage through it? On average, the S&P 500 has a drop of about 20% every two and a half years. That's a good forest fire to clean out the excesses. Well, we have not had that happen in eight years. So if you've built a nest egg, say $2 million, and we have what would be a normal market correction, just part of the price of admission for investing, at least in equities, you had a $2 million portfolio, you have a normal 20% correction, that's $400,000. Eight or nine years ago, when you were younger, I'm still throwing assets at it. I'm still working and earning money. If you are nearing or at retirement where you're not earning money or it's about to go away and you're not continuing to invest, you're hitting that pivot point of making your investment assets productive to serve you rather than you to serve it. That's a lot different equation in terms of how you will handle a market correction. That's one reason why we are doing this market correction fire drill. And we're going to talk about step one today, as well as answer some listener questions, but we can't do any of that until after this important disclaimer. When something wicked this way comes, it's probably best not to grab the first person available or someone who seems to know what they're doing and ask them, where to hide, or how to protect yourself. They may actually lead you unintentionally to greater danger. That's why it's important to consider this helpful hints and education and only ask shelter, only take advice from someone that truly knows you in your situation. And that could be your legal advisor. That could be your tax advisor. It could be your financial advisor. It's definitely not me, <laughs> unless you're a client. We're going to talk a little bit about indexes today, the S&P 500 and historical market returns. It's important to realize you can't invest in indexes. You can invest in things that try to mimic them, but you can't invest in them. And past performance is no guarantee of future results. You know this, but you should always be reminded of this like we're doing right here. Now, let's go to the market correction fire drill, step one. One in the Hot Topic segment. This is a test. This station is conducting a test of the emergency broadcasting system. This is only a test. Oh, that noise is annoying. Well, on the Hot Topic segment today, we are going to do a fire drill on... What to do to prepare yourself for a market correction. Now, it's important to realize, hey, this is only a test. I have no clue when the market correction will happen. 
I am certainly not predicting when the market correction is going to happen. And given that we've been hitting all-time highs, it feels like every other day, it makes sense to prepare ourselves now when we're feeling happy and rational and a little bit more wealthy than we did maybe six months ago. So over the next few weeks, we are going to go step-by-step through a market correction fire drill on things we can do now to help fortify ourselves, fortify ourselves for when the inevitable market correction happens so we can be positioned, hopefully, to weather the storm and be focused on working towards the retirement that we want. When you're younger, these type of things don't feel like they're so critical, right? Because you're continuing to throw money at things and you're growing and you know you're going to be earning money for a while. But right now, if you're near retirement or at retirement or in retirement, this could be one of the most important things you do from an investment standpoint. So step one in this market correction fire drill is to make sure you know how much risk you're taking. That's part one of step one. And then part two of step one is to make sure that's actually tied to the plan that you have to live the life that you want in retirement. This is not the time to take undue investment risk just because you can tolerate it. Now, we talked about this on probably a number of episodes over the last three and a half years, but our industry focuses on maximum risk tolerance, and they use questionnaires to help design the portfolio that they say you can tolerate that will hopefully maximize risks. We may have just talked about this last week, but it bears repeating. That is a could be a recipe for disaster during or near retirement. Because what you can tolerate from an investment risk standpoint, and risk we're talking about volatility, ups and downs, what you can tolerate may have no connection whatsoever to the lifestyle that you're hoping to live in retirement. In fact, it may be a lot more risky than you truly need. So using these risk tolerance questionnaires to dial that in could lead you really astray if you're fairly risk tolerant. Really what we want to get is the minimum effective dose of investment volatility, potential investment volatility, that will position you with reasonable assumptions to actually succeed in the spending plan, the life plan that you've put together. So the first step is, one, know how much risk you're taking right now. Because if you're near retirement, even if you don't realize it, you're moving from an accumulation stage to a distribution stage, which, yeah, that's a different math equation, but it's also a very different psychological equation. The factors that drive you are going to be different because you're going from focused on growth to focus on extracting from what you've built. So let me just give you an example here. So let's say we have Bob, okay? Bob is 60 years old. Bob has $1 million in an IRA and 600000 in a after-tax account. So this is just a hypothetical illustration using the process that I use. So we got Bob, he's 60 years old, he's got a million bucks in an IRA, he's got 600000 in an after-tax account, and Bob wants to spend $70,000 after-tax inflation adjusted until he dies at 90. So we've got a 30-year time frame. I'm not factoring in Social Security, I'm keeping this really simple. So the question becomes, okay, if this is what Bob wants to do, and we're using stochastic modeling or the process that I use... How should Bob invest his $1.6 million to help generate the income that he needs? Well, one way Bob could figure this out is to do a risk tolerance questionnaire that's going to ask him really the following questions with some variety. In fact, I just Googled one and got one from one of the major brokerage firms that independent investors use. So question number one is, I plan to begin withdrawing money from my investments in, and then they have multiple choice. So with Bob, we'll say less than three years. The next question is, once I begin withdrawing money from my funds, I plan to spend all of the funds in 11 years or more, right? Because he's not going to spend them all. 
The risk tolerance is how would you describe your investment knowledge? None, limited, good, extensive. When I invest my money, I then ask some qualitative questions. Select the current investments you own. It's asking, you know, bonds and or stocks and just different things that you own. And then the next question is consider the scenario. And it says, imagine that in the past three months, the overall stock market lost 25% of its value. An individual stock investment you own also lost 25% of value. What would you do? And it goes to sell, sell some, do nothing, buy more. And then there's another question, you know, trying to give scenarios of different market performances and what you would do given a certain return experience or loss experience. And then in the back end with this questionnaire, they score how you answer each question because it's a multiple choice question. And then based on your risk score, it will put you in the portfolio on what's called the efficient frontier that will match what it says your risk tolerance is to a asset allocation to try to maximize return for that given risk tolerance. That is you know, the, how, how this works. So Bob would probably go through something like this. Now, let's just assume Bob is fairly comfortable with risk. He always has been. He never did anything in 2008 as far as selling. He never panicked. And so Bob is, you know, he's not, he's not afraid of markets. He believes in the long-term averages. And so he answers his questions based on that mindset. Now, here's an interesting aside. We're assuming Bob is entering this today. And Bob has just enjoyed eight years of positive returns and feels comfortable from economic news standpoint that things are going pretty well. So he's going to answer that from that mindset, which if you were to quiz Bob maybe at the bottom of 08 or say March 9th, 2009, when we were at the very bottom of the markets, his mindset might have been very different. Most likely, and I think studies show this, is that people are pretty optimistic and risk non-averse. They're not averse to risk when things are going well. And then when things are stressful from a market performance perspective, we actually get less risky in nature, more risk adverse. So this is not a very exact science, but this is how Bob in the scenario is determining how much risk we should take. So let's do this. Let's say Bob's got $1.6 million. He's 60 years old, wants to withdraw $70,000 a year. Let me run a model saying what is his chances of success given lots of different portfolios. So if we go to, and I'll send you a quick PDF of this in Six Shot Saturday so you can see the spread. So if he does an equity growth portfolio, and these are just models that I use for planning purposes, which is basically 100% stocks, it shows that 82% probability of success in Bob spending that $70,000 a year for 30 years. So on 100% equities, he's got about 82% probability of success, given the model. Now, let's talk about the downside of that, because 82, it's on the low end of where I'm comfortable with, but it's still reasonable to go through that if he used this equity growth model that I'm using from the Great Recession, which would be October 07, which is sort of the high of the market, all the way down to March 09. So that's the very peak to the very bottom of that wicked market experience we had. An equity growth portfolio would have gone down 51%. So although the probability of success is 82% in this model, he would, might have had to endure a loss of half of his assets, which totally would have blown up this plan. So obviously, Bob's probably not that risky. But the question is, and this is why, one, you need to know how much risk you're taking going in, one, to see if you can handle it and it's the ride that you signed up for. But two, you also want to tie the risk that you're taking to the kind of life that you want to live now that you've actually reached retirement. So let's look at other portfolio models to see if they help Bob at all. Let's look at a what I call a balanced two portfolio, which is roughly 45% in equities and 55% in fixed income. And I'm summarizing, and this is just for an example, so don't take this as gospel, right? 
we're using indexes, assuming it's rebalanced every year, you know, blah, blah, blah. You'll get all the disclosures if you get Six Shots Saturday and look at it in detail. So rather than be 100% in equities, let's just say he's 45, 50% in equities. What percentage of the time, what's the probability of success of Bob hitting his spending plan modeling this? And it's about 81%. So 100% equities is 82% probability of success in this example. And then about 45, 50% in equities is about 81% probability of success, virtually the same. Now, what's the downside experience that that portfolio would have had, assuming you rebalanced and blah, 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 in the Great Recession from October 07 down to March 09, the peak of the market to the bottom of the market? We remember that the equity growth portfolio would have been down 51% and the balanced one portfolio would have been down 15%. Doesn't mean that that's the right portfolio for him. The point is, if Bob were to fill out a risk tolerance questionnaire and he happened to be fairly tolerant of risk, he may have had something between those that was a lot more risky than he needed necessarily to get the job done in terms of positioning himself to live the life that he's trying to live for he and his family. Doesn't mean that he has to go with something so conservative as this balanced one, but it helps him identify what the minimum effective dose of risk is to get the job done. And it's good to know that just as it's good to know what's the most risky one that you can take to get the job done. Because then you can actually make informed decisions about how much risk you want to take as an investor. Because the downside to going more conservative is there's less upside, right? If markets go well and the return sequence actually works out in your favor in terms of when these corrections have. But that should be an informed decision of how much risk you want to take, just like an informed decision of when you want to retire. This is an important one. I have clients who consciously choose to take more than the minimum effective dose of risk because of the entirety of their situation. And then I have clients that don't. And sometimes they have to give in other areas of their life because they don't want to have to endure the potential emotional pain of being more volatile than they need to be. So step one in the market correction fire drill is to first know how much risk you're taking in your investment portfolio. And if you're nearing retirement, it's more important than ever before. And then step two, start to look at what's the minimum effective dose of risk I need to take to get the life that I want to do, which means it has to be tied to some kind of plan, some type of spending plan, so you can make a more informed decision. Because God, it would be horrible to go through a wicked market correction when you didn't realize you were taking as much risk as you were, And you didn't realize the impact it could have on your ability to actually create the retirement you want. So that's step one. We're going through this. I'm going through this internally right now between now and the end of the year with all my clients. But I think it's this is a good first step. Now, next week in step two of the market correction, we're going to get into more tactical things you can do. But we got to start here because this is where the big decisions are. So tune in for next week for step two. Now, let's go answer a few listener questions. Welcome to the Practical Planning segment this week. Now, Nicole, she is not with us today. So sad, but for a good reason. She is out Christmas shopping. So very exciting. Now, here's a a helpful tip if you have people that work for you. Make sure you give them their bonus early so they have money to actually spend on the gift they're going to get you. Very smart. So no doubt Nicole is out there looking for something special for me. I've tried to be extra nice so it's not Cole. But anyway, we'll march on without her with a few questions because we have some piling up. So I want to make sure we do these every week. And the first one comes from Diane. So let's listen to Diane. Hi, Roger. My name is Diane and my husband Dave and I are interested in learning about retirement and we are planning but very concerned about the cost of health insurance before we qualify for Medicare. We've been saving a lot and look forward to a comfortable and enjoyable retirement, but we're worried about what our health insurance costs might be. Can you provide us with some answers and some resources? Thanks so much. 
Hey, Diane, that is a great question that it's really a hard one right now because we don't know what the game field looks like with the exchanges and changes coming up. What I found is most likely you're going to spend more on healthcare prior to Medicare than you will in Medicare. So here, I'm not punting, but here's what we're going to do, Diane, and I think I announced this already, but I don't think it was before I got your question, is after the first of the year, meaning January, February, we are going to do a multi-episode series, maybe three or four weeks, where all we talk about is healthcare prior to Medicare. We're going to bring on some experts in the healthcare field from the private Christian exchanges that you see happening to actual healthcare insurance providers to try to grapple with, one, what options should we choose for healthcare in terms of the types of policies? And two, what type of cost are we looking at? So what's the cost that we're looking at and what are the options to help the dials that we have to move up and down to help control that cost? So I want to make sure that I got you on today, Diane, because that's an important question. And you submitted this a little bit ago, so I apologize about that. And two, I wanted to make sure that you realized we're going to be doing a multi-week series just on healthcare before Medicare. So I don't really have an answer for you today, but we're going to really dive into the subject after the first of the year. So our next question comes from David. And let me read his question here since Nicole's not here. Love the podcast. Well, that's just me. That's not David. (laughs) He says, you asked for some questions, so here's mine. I am 66 years old. I'm about to retire in a few months, and I'm pretty well prepared. I've worked with financial analysts for over 20 years, and he agrees. I think it's he. He might be a she. As I get to this decumulation phase of my life, what would be your one or two book recommendations for someone like me? Now, David says he understands the basics of 401ks, RMDs, pensions, Social Security, Medicare, but knowing more is always better. I know you've made some book recommendations in the past on the podcast, but was wondering if there was anything for someone already retired? That's a great question, David. I love books. Now, I've heard about this book coming out. It's coming out officially March 2018, but the rumor is the Kindle version or the Nook version is available today. It's called Rock Retirement, written by some amazing author. I mean, I think this guy is just, he's just it. So you might want to check that out. So that's my Number one recommendation, David, if you email me, I think I have an extra copy from this guy laying around and I'll send you one. But a couple other books that are not by, maybe not quite as amazing guy, but still pretty cool. The first one is by, well, it's called Investing for a Lifetime. This is by Dr. Richard Marston. Now, he is a professor at the Warrant School of business. When I did my Certified Investment Management Analyst program, I got to spend a week with him. And the guy's a genius when it comes to wealth management and investing. And he wrote a book called Investing for a Lifetime, which is talking about managing wealth for the new normal of retirement. So that might give you some little bit different framework for thinking about the management of investment assets from someone who has studied this for years in detail that you know, I'm still amazed by. So that would be the first book. It's called Investing for a Lifetime by Dr. Richard Marston. The next couple of books are going to be not technical, but more behavioral to help you. So the first one of those is by Jeff Olson, and it's called The Slight Edge. It's a good book, and it talks about, really just talks about doing little tiny things consistently over time in order to make big impacts in your life. And I think it's a great framework for really any age about the importance of the little things we do and the daily habits that we create rather than trying to do big things all at once. Because there's a lot of power in that compounding. And the reason I think that's good for you, David, or for someone in retirement, is it helps create rituals that you can focus on to create a great life intentionally when you're, in a lot of ways, living in a very unstructured way because you're outside of your career. So I would check that out. And then the last one, I would recommend is, and I may have recommended this one before, Essentialism, The Disciplined Pursuit of Less by Greg McEwen. I need to get him on the show. He's a good guy. Great book. I've read it maybe four or five times, and it just talks about really the unimportance of nearly everything. So you're going to have a lot of time on your hands, David. 
It's going to be important that you fill those with things that are important. If you don't do that intentionally, they're going to be filled with a lot of really unimportant things. And a lot of those things can be very unhealthy from a psychological, physical, or other standpoint. So those would be the three books. We need to do a book recommendation show again. I need to do that every year. What's interesting is I get emails all the time, unsolicited from people saying, hey, I got a book. Let me be on the show. I guess I'll be doing that here shortly too to get onto the shows. I'm really selective. Usually I'm only, if you hear an author on the show, it's because I read their book and I go out and talk to them. I rarely take unsolicited offers because I think there's a lot of great books out there, but there's a lot of just books and I want to make sure that we have ones that are important. So you could also check out the show and see what books or authors we featured because that might help you too, David. Okay, so next week we are going to start with step two of the market correction fire drill. And we'll get to more listener questions. We only did a couple today because we focused on this market correction. So until then, though, let's talk about how we can be happy in the happy lab. Hey, welcome to the happy lab where we noodle on how to be happy. And guess what? I was caught. I was caught by a listener. And here's what she said. She said, Roger, On the last few shows, you have made some inferences to your age or being older and not as fast, etc. Maybe it has to do with your assistant being younger or the person you had on the show recently who was 34. I would recommend, this is a listener, and I'm sorry, I don't have her name in front of me, but she was very kind to do this. She says, I would recommend being sensitive to that thinking because you are not old and saying those things reinforce in your mind something. That is not true. I really like your show, respect you, and was caught off guard recently when I heard those comments. You may think the 32-year-old or 34-year-old guy knows something you don't, but I can assure you he is still lacking the real experience you bring to the table. God bless you and thank you for calling me on that. Many times we say things, we have this self-talk, I'm not fast, I'm a horrible investor. I'm getting older. And that's a good one for this show, for sure, right? I'm getting older. I feel older. And you start to say that. And what I said to her was, yeah, lately I've been achy. I'm feeling older. And I think that was part of it. But, and I also said this, I said, but I'm working on it. I'm doing yoga. I'm cycling. I'm doing things to address the aches I feel. So I think we go through that self-talk in rhythms, right? When we're feeling down, we get a little bit down, but then we come back up. I think the danger is and this is for everybody, is that self-talk like that, I am getting older, I can't be as active as I once was, that gets hardwired and then it becomes your reality. And that will zap the joy of life. And that's probably one of the biggest risks of getting older is you start to redefine your world in more limiting ways, which zaps the happiness of your life. Don't do that. On your marks, get set. We're off on a seven-day challenge to take a little tiny baby step to create the kind of life and retirement we want. So in the next seven days, good time to do it before the end of the year, understand how much investment risk you're taking in terms of, so look at your asset allocation, assuming that you rebalance in some systematic way, hopefully you are, look at the amount of risk that you're taking. One, that's a great first step. And if you want to be a high achiever, start seeing talking to your advisor or doing your own analysis as to whether you're taking more than you necessarily need to to get the job done and start to understand that. That's going to be a harder one, but I think right now it's important to look at your asset allocation and then you can find resources online or you can use the table that I'll be sending out in Six Shots Saturday to see where, you know, which one is closest to your allocation. So you get an idea of what it looked like in the Great Recession to see if that's a ride that you might be willing to go on as a worst case scenario. So that's your action item. Hey, thanks for listening to the show today. I still have a lot of books that I would like you to have in your hands. That's the reason I bought all those books that are in my living room is because I want to give them to you. We'll be selling them when they come out in March, but I would much rather give one to you. And the way I'm asking you to do that right now is if you buy the Kindle or the Nook version and you leave a review, an honest review, and I've got some good honest reviews that smarted a little bit, but they were good. Leave an honest review 
send me a quick email with your address and I'll mail you one for free. I'll even pay the shipping. I bought the book. I'm going to pay the shipping, but I'd rather you have the message. And this is a good win-win. You'll help me by leaving a review, whether it's in the Nook version or the Kindle version. You're going to help elevate the book so we can get other people on board with the kind of life that they probably want to live if they heard the message and they wanted to think about it. So encourage you to do that. I'd love to get a book in your hands. Now, next week, we'll have Nicole back, which will be fun. And then we will also go into some tactical things you can do to help protect you for potential correction coming up. Have a great day. We appreciate you joining us today for this episode of Retirement Answer Man. Be sure to visit rogerwhitney.com slash answers to access the Retirement Answer Library with over 30 checklists to help you make the most of the only life you have. Remember, you have more power than you realize to create an amazing life starting today with Retirement Answer Man. The opinions voiced in this material are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. All performance reference is historical and no guarantee of future results. All indices are unmanaged and may not be invested into directly. Have a wonderful day.